So you're still just living the dream, huh? This is your domain. This is my place. This is the hangout. This is the office. All the above. It's got that that familiar dank, yeah, <laughs> mildewy that, smell. That 30 grown men in here at once smell. <laughs> <laughs> This is my seventh year in the league, f uh, fifth year with the minors, and second year as a coach, first year in the front office. This is Steve, a former teammate of mine back from 2012. We played together on a Frontier League team called the Evansville Otters, and actually found out that we played against each other in college as members of the same conference, the America East. And as it turned out, Steve was on the other side of the lines, playing for Stony Brook, on one of the most pivotal days of my baseball career. The day I blew my elbow out was, yes, against Stony Brook, and Steve was in the lineup. And as it turned out, he had a pretty major role, at least in my eyes that day. And what was that role? He was, well, the villain. 0-1 pitch. Drive to left field, that gets over the head of Cooper. Ball game over. Walk off single for Steve Marino as the captain delivers and the Miners come all the way back. This is Bossy Field. And though the name may not sound familiar, you probably do know it. This was the field that Steve and I called home when we played for the Evansville Otters. And this is the ballpark where they filmed the entire movie, A League of Their Own. Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball! Truer words have never been spoken. And when a team has a player that's struggling, they don't cry about it. Rather, what they do is they call around and they try to find his replacement. And so, in July, when our third baseman was struggling mightily, Steve got a chance. And one day, he arrived in our clubhouse. The thing with Steve was that when he joined the team, he just, like, killed it. Just, like, right away, hitting, making plays in the field. Like, everyone just knew that he was a gritty player and he just like immediately assimilated, which that's one of the hardest things to do sometimes is you join a new team, you wanna prove your worth, but he was just like, bam, I'm, I'm here to stay. When you joined the team in 2012, like you made an impact right away. Like mm -hmm. mentally, that's not easy. Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely a, a hit. First couple of weeks were tough. Uh, it was right before the All-Star break, so I played and I got to go home and come back, but I think I just stayed quiet. I knew I was a rookie, I kind of knew my role. I just tried to go out there and compete every day. I was hitting the bottom of the lineup, not a lot of pressure. I just didn't put pressure on myself. I trusted my ability and kept reminding myself that I'm here for a reason. I wasn't, it's not a fluke and it wasn't by any kind of chance that I was, I was chosen to be on the team and chosen to be written in the lineup every day and just had that mentality and kind of played fearless as a rookie that I kind of was playing with house money. I was so excited to be there and just perform and, and be able to compete at the next level and that kind of carried me through my rookie season. So he quickly established himself as like an everyday contributor. I mean, he just jumped right into third base, did well, played great D, like played hard. And uh, like the, as a pitcher, like we were happy to have a guy that could do that because we just had some holes in our defense and any guy who's gonna come out there and like give up his body to make a play for us, like we're all in. So for the pitching staff, like Steve was a great pickup. Two outs in the bottom of the ninth. Runner on first, and the pitch is driven deep in the air to left field. Back goes Jacobs on the track at the wall. Goodbye! Steve Marino with a walk-off two-run homer, and the Miners are champions of the East Division in 2015! What a dramatic way to clinch your second division title in a row. So do you miss playing? Do you feel like you get that itch? Yeah, sometimes. But at the same time, I'm still on a field every day and there's not the pressure of having to hit every two innings and be the reason, direct reason for a win or a loss. Obviously as a coach, you have a little hand in it, but I'm not a player anymore, so I don't physically strike out or get a hit in a big spot or punch out in a big spot. So yeah, it's a it's totally different. You feel like baseball is a small world. Very small. It's the smallest, right? The smallest. The degrees of separation are so small. It's not even funny. That's our menu for the day. There's a lot of a lot of memories in that pen for me. <laughs> Do you miss Long Island? 
Yeah, I do, especially the food. The Food's not the bag. The bagels. The bagels and the pizza. The pizza's impeccable. Pizza's awesome. I mean, you guys are snobs about it, but it's true. Like you have every right to be. It's so I, much better. There's some things that you could dispute, but I really you can't dispute the pizza thing. New York pizza is the best. How do you feel like you remembered as a player? Like to me, you were gritty from like day one. Yeah, I would say just a guy that was going to go out and compete every day, no matter what. Hurt. I mean, guys knew. I used to foul the ball off my left shin so much, and I, I have pictures of it all the way from my ankle all the way up to my knee, just purple and blue, hobbling. I would just continue to play. I was fortunate enough to never be hurt, well, injured, and on a DL my whole career. So for five years straight, I was able and eligible to play every game, and I took pride in that. So hopefully, guys remember me as a good teammate and. Someone who did some pretty nice stuff on the field. Sometimes, not all the time. But yeah, I just want to be a good teammate and a guy that hustled and, and played hard. And I would agree. I would say that's probably the way he's remembered. And in fact, back in 2008, when I was pitching against him in the conference tournament game, when I was wearing a UMBC jersey and he was wearing a Stony Brook jersey, he was indeed a gritty, tough to get out player. What do you remember about that day in, uh, in Farmingdale? <laughs> That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I was, again, we played together when I was a rookie, and then we p competed against each other in college when I was a freshman. So I was a young pup. And I just was so overwhelmed by the whole thing. Tons of people there for a Long Island game anyway. And it was game one, so no one was going to win the whole thing or go home that day. But obviously being 1-0 and or 0-1 is a huge deal. So there was high stakes. I just remember two Bulldogs pitching against each other and going absolutely crazy every time we did anything good offensively because base runners and, and runs were so hard to come by that day. It was the, the first game of the conference tournament and it was a close game. I had two outs in the sixth inning. I just needed one more out to get. I had runners on second and third and there was this right-hander up. And I felt my elbow pop. I felt this, this vibration shoot down my arm and after that, all I wanted to do was get off that mound. So I called out my catcher. I called out Tom. We talked. I asked him, do you see anything different? Like, is anything else going on? He said, no. Like, I think you're okay. Like, your velocity's still there. So we regrouped. I tried to just get through the inning because there were 15 scouts in the stands. Most of them were there because the guy I was facing, Tom Kohler, was a highly touted prospect he threw hard he had a great slider he was a, a bulldog pitcher on the mound um, but I was holding my own and it might have been my chance if I could just get through that game and get off that mound in one piece but I couldn't in the end I made some good pitches and he kept battling he kept fouling them off and after like 10 or 12 pitches later the guy bounced like a 19 hopper down the line and I just helplessly watched it rattle around the corner, both runs scored, and he trod into second base. And even all these years later as I tell that story, this the, it's just that guy, that right-hander, why couldn't he have swung and missed? Why couldn't he have just rolled over a ground ball right into my third baseman's glove and just been out so I could get off that mound with all those scouts watching? It was just really random that there was like another guy from my conference like when we played together. Yeah. Because the American East is a small, like kind of whatever conference. Yeah, you don't really expect to see each other after you're done playing against each other. No, for sure not. And of course, I mean, the weird thing about indie ball was that most guys aren't from and from big schools. Like no. there was never like any SEC guys playing indie yeah. ball. It's like all like the smaller school guys, right. not like Stony Brook small, but it's, it's like seems it's like guys who yeah. didn't get like the big chances. Well, probably because all the SEC guys are probably in double A. Yeah. Well, and I feel like if you get that like big time experience and you don't get drafted, you're like, why would I want to right. keep going? It's almost a step backwards. Yeah. You play in front of more people at Florida, Alabama, and Arkansas than, than you do at Bossy Field or Rentland Park. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Steve and I like slowly got to know each other a little bit, just chit chat before and after games. And when he told me that he went to Stony Brook, I was like, huh, I wonder if we played together. We had, we had that one year overlap. I wonder if he was in that game when I pitched in college. He was. And then I started thinking, where was he in the order? And then one day it dawned on me. 
And then finally, I went to the box score. I want to know who was that guy? Who was that guy who would not get out? Who would not let me off that mount? You just couldn't have, have freaking rolled over that ball like five pitches earlier. You know what's funny? You had to drag it out to 12, 12 pitches and then a pansy little double you know, down line. I know. I, at least I, it would have been better if it was something better that we could say, hey, at least I squared you. Yeah, up. like a three run jack. Yeah, didn't know any power. Didn't know power. Nah. Just, didn't didn't know what Big guy hitting right. singles. That's it. Yeah. Third baseman. <laughs> warning, warning track. <laughs> warning track, Steve. <laughs> That's it. That's what they used to call me. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I get Tommy John, you get a 19 hop double. And you know what? That sounds like a good trade off. I, I mean this. If I knew what was going to happen in the future, I would have just swung over a breaking ball just or something. Yeah. Play that. <laughs> just stick it out and roll it over or punch it out, and I would have said, maybe you saved you a couple innings or something. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's interesting how it works. <laughs> That's good. <laughs>